I'm going to start to start our education panel. Folks can uh, move to the attendees part or you can stay on if you want. So just wanted to say thank you. And um, for our, our, our education panel, thank, um, you. thank you so much, guys, um, for our education panel. Yeah. I want to take a brief moment before we start to um, say hello to our two elected officials today, uh, Carlina Rivera, our amazing city council member on the east side, and then um, Arvella Samos, who's joining us all the way from Queens. <laughs> so, uh, Carlina, can you say a couple of words, and then have, uh, and then Arvella, can you say a couple of words just to say hello to everyone? And um, also, you know, I know that you guys are doing so much during uh, this crisis, so I want to say thank you um, for for continuing to support our community. Oh, thank you for your partnership. You lean in for like an epic town hall. Let me tell you, this is why you need more women in office. We are the ones that can hold down a six hour town hall, answer questions, go do the deliveries, maybe get 30 minutes of yoga in because we need it. But, um, I just wanna, I wanna thank you. You've covered so many topics today. I was looking at all of the things that you covered and right now the criminal justice piece is so important because we have been calling to release more people from Rikers Island. You have seen where this virus has really run rampant. It's in our prisons, it's in our nursing homes, and it's in really our shelter system where people cannot social distance. So really with a flick of a pen, you know, clemency can save lives. So thank you for that last panel. And, and for, the, for the people here who are gonna talk on education, I've learned so much from, from many of you and we're really working together to try to kind of live this new normal, but also figure out how we're gonna help all of the, the, the children and the students in our city who, you know, I represent uh, school district one and two, and, and so does Yulene, and they are so, so, so different. And we don't want it to be that way, but, but that is our reality in, in terms of inequity and resources. So I know this is really about the budget, um, this kind of a focus there. The city is about to enter negotiations. I know the state will likely get back together they're going to figure a few things out to try to help New Yorkers. And um, we're, I know, I know, mm, but <laughs> oh, we know. Let's hope. I, know. I hope, I hope, but listen, listen, you know who the fighters are, you know where they were when, when it came down to making a really tough decision on a budget that left zero dollars for NYCHA, that left so many people out in the cold and we want to do the right thing. So the city, we're going to face a, a really, really, some really tough challenges ahead. $2 billion in cuts in this fiscal year, five to seven billion in the next. We are all focused on what we think are the necessities that's housing, healthcare, food and education and in New York City transportation as well. And so those are gonna be really what we hone in on in terms of making sure that we restore those programs and services that are so important. Um, every day we're working, we're working around the clock. And I just wanna thank all the experts, all the people, the panelists, the activists, the parents, uh, just the concerned neighbors that have helped us do this work. Um, it is not easy and um, it has been incredibly stressful, but we have so much talent and expertise here in New York City that uh, I know that we don't walk alone. So I just wanna thank you. Thank everyone for participating. Uh, I know we're going into education and you're about to hear from, uh, uh, again, a number of people. You know, Naomi Pena gave me the idea that for a Facebook Live special, we should have someone to talk about family wellness and coping with mental health especially when we're thinking about our students, our teachers, and what they're going through. The guidance counselors, the social workers, dealing with death, remote learning, and everything else. So we are bringing someone on this Tuesday at 7.30. I hope you'll join us. And uh, thank you, Yulene. Thank you, Assemblywoman, uh, for, for working so hard and, and continuing to slay. Thanks, Carlina. Arabella. Oh, oh, there you're unmuted now. You're, oh, you're... let me. Oh, great. All right, hello, nice. everyone. Hello, Yulene. Hello, Carlina. Hello, everyone who's on this, uh, who's on this call. I really want to thank my colleague, Assemblywoman New. She is fierce. She can put this together. She can go out and help feed her constituents, get them PPE, do all of this, and look fantastic doing it. So I see you there. Um, but nonetheless, look, it's an, it's an incredibly stressful time right now for everyone particularly for families, particularly for students. Uh, you know, right now, during this whole crisis, what I have, on, what I, I've always recognized this and realized this, but I know it more than ever now, we have to reevaluate how we, how we fund and how we pay our labor in this city. I think we need to reshuffle where our, where our resources go, because I think teachers and educators 
need to get paid at least double. I can't tell you how hard it is to educate a seven and a half year old. I have my daughter here homeschooling. It's crazy. I, I mean, I want to erect statues to all the educators because it is, it really is God's work, what you're doing. So thank you. You know, Yulene, you and I have talked about um, this budget, which has been, you know, we didn't do what we needed to do this year in the state. What we need to do is make sure that we have more resources to pay for the things that we need. Particularly as our children start to start a new school year, we have to make sure that we have the resources to invest in them. Every child, every educator, everyone should have access to mental health uh, resources because this is an incredibly stressful time. And as much as you try to uh, make it upbeat and um, hopeful for them, they are suffering. They really are suffering, whether they express it or not. Every child and every educator should have an opportunity to talk to somebody starting the next school year, whenever that should be, or whenever they need to, in order to be able to get the help that they, that they may need. Um, so again, Yulene, I, I can't tell you how important this is because really what we should be focusing on, if we do do adjustments in our state budget and as a city is determining what their budget is gonna look like, we need to have more resources to pay for the critical things that we need. And the only way we can do that is if, you know, we tax more people and tax the people who can actually pay for these services. But thank you all. You mean thank you, Carlina. Good luck on the city budget. It's gonna be it's gonna be a tough one this year, I'm sure. And some of it's our fault. Sorry. Sorry. Yep. Um, thank you so much, Arabella, for joining us. I'm gonna mute you now again um, just so that we can bring up our panelists. Um, I I'm really excited about this panel because um, this is uh, one of the biggest issues going on right now for so many parents and so for so many students in our district. Um, we're going to talk about education and the way that our budget is affecting education. Uh, it's going to be a tough discussion. Um, so everybody be prepared. It's not pretty right now. Um, we have the amazing Naomi Pena, uh, the president of CEC1. Um, we have Shino Tanikawa, the member of CEC2. Uh, I also have Zakia Ansari, the advocacy director and New York City director of the Alliance for Quality Education. Um, Zakia and I have been fighting side by side for almost, I want to say like almost 10 years now for, um, for making sure that we've got uh, funding for education. And I just want to say thank you to all of you for your advocacy. And right now, um, this is, this is insane. Like, I, don't even, I don't even know what to say. This is traumatic. And so our budget um, this year has cuts to education and the governor is still proposing $10 billion more cuts. Um, and some of that's also coming from education and we have not fully even funded our education system um, in so long that the need has grown and the disparity has uh, grown um, larger and larger and larger every single year. Uh, our district, our school district here in lower Manhattan has been on the front page news of the New York Times for segregation and we've we've had issues here that have long time been um, you know it it been socioeconomic as well as um, uh, uh, racially and ethnically that needed to be addressed for a very very long time and I wanted to say uh, again that we have a ton of questions <laughs> that have already come in on education and so um, but I'm gonna just for, for brevity and for um, for uh, for us to be able to kind of get everything in, um, we do have a hard stop at six. But I do want to say that um, you know uh, this is one of the most important discussions that we can have. We are lacking resources, and I went over already some of the things that we lacked in budget for education. But I want to say that you know for just for the people at home and the process that things go through, um, education and healthcare are the two biggest pots of money within our state budget. And so anytime um, the governor looks to cut something, he reaches for the biggest pots instead of looking at the entire budget and seeing where it is like corporate tax rates. Maybe we can stop giving some of those. I don't know. Um, some of the little things that are, you know, mad horrible in our prison uh, system, like maybe we should be um, looking at, some, at cutting some of those things that we're, that we're paying for. And like, like maybe some of the things that we're doing um, when we're saving money and investing in NORCs and things like that, like in our healthcare system, we should be 
choosing those things as savings. You know, we should be investing in infrastructure instead of, um, you know, instead of cutting where we can't afford it, which is, you know, our students right now are one of the biggest investments that we can make in helping to restart our economy. And yet, and yet we're cutting everywhere, including our SYEP program, which I believe is actually a racial justice issue. I want to put that out there. Um, and I want to thank Carlina for her incredible advocacy on trying to bring back SYEP. Thank you so much, Carlina, for standing firm with us. Um, but I wanted to, uh, you know, kind of have a quick intro between the three of you. Um, and then uh, I'm going to go and jump right into questions because there's just so many. So um, I'm going to start. Uh, I'm going to start with Naomi since uh, she's first on the list. Hi, everyone. My name is Naomi Pena. I'm CEC1 president, but I'm also a lifelong um, born and raised in the Lower East Side. And I'm fortunate, as I always say, that I can even raise my four kids in the Lower East Side. Um, just getting right straight to the budget. I think um, one of my biggest frustrations is that um, education, every time we go into budget season, regardless of what the situation is, there's always a, 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 a scare tactic around budgets. Even when we're like high money flowing in, it's always the budgets are going to be dire. We have to cut. And it's always like, you know, how much do you call a bluff? But I understand there we're in a dire situation now. My biggest frustration is um, as just as a parent and now a parent advocate and leader, I think there are certain things that should be sacrilege. We should not be touching education. We should not be touching healthcare. Um, we cannot expect to continue to cut the only source of revenue that public schools have to educate the children, 1.1 million kids in the city. It is literally the only resource they have. So if you start cutting the money, what do you think that's gonna mean? That's gonna mean more kids in the classroom. That's gonna be less people to hire for the kids. Thus, we're gonna have more kids in the classroom. We're gonna not have the ability to hire enough staff to provide the related services that a lot of the students with disabilities needs. They're going to have to double and triple up. We already don't have enough money for um, guidance counselors that we're going to need direly when school goes back in session because of the trauma this experience has caused. So, you know, short of, of doing a, a form of like, I, I, this is why this gets really overwhelming, really stressful, because, you know, every year we hear the same thing, but it became so clear by what was being reported out by Assemblywoman Yulene and Harvey Epstein, how depressing it really truly was that I was terrified. And the fact that, you know, yes, it has been allocated, but the fact that that is going to be threatened, depending on how this continues to move, doesn't sit well with me. And I, I think we all need to start taking a hard look at, at ourselves that we want to elevate everyone, but we really don't want to elevate everyone. Because if we really care to elevate every single person, every single child in the school system, we wouldn't be touching the budget. Um, because then now we are relying on PTAs to start funding the difference. And not all PTAs are built equally. So I think we, we have to take a hard look at ourselves and how we're going to manage the expectations that we demand of our students. All right, Shino. Great. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, it's actually a little bit depressing on a beautiful Sunday, but it's important that we talk about it, right? So I want to start with just laying a little bit of um, a, a sort of on the ground research anecdotal stories that I'm hearing from families of how remote learning is going. We still have families without digital devices. That is a truth. We have families with digital devices, but without reliable internet connection. We have families with a digital device shared amongst multiple students in the same household. We have families who are in a one room hotel room in temporary housing trying to find food and trying to manage remote learning. So that is the reality. And even some of the more affluent families, some of my friends are struggling because their kids have 
disabilities. And there's just no way that all their needs can be met through remote learning. They need one-on-one -on -one in person services. So what this all means is some students are sliding back. Many students are not getting what they need in terms of academic instruction, but also emotional supports. So when we start the next school year, we're gonna be starting from a deficit place, right? We're going backwards or we're not making progress. And what that means is we're gonna need more resources, not less. Mm -hmm. There's just no way to talk about this without realizing that we are in a pandemic, we all know that. And what that really means is that we are gonna need more resources for our students, not less. And I understand finances are tough, but none of the revenue bills passed. And I really, really want those revenue bills to move forward. Yes. Right, I don't care what those rich people have to say. It's time that we, we elevate the needs of our most vulnerable students. And the only way to do that is their fair share need to be contributed. This is time when everybody has to contribute. Why should they get off with their second homes and whatever and not kick in and contribute to the recovery of our society that made them rich in the first place? So the revenue bills are important. In terms of cuts to the education at the city level, we have to find another way. We cannot cut monies that go into the classrooms. That's fair student funding. We, can, we just simply cannot do that. Because if we do that, then we're gonna be paying for the cost, the price of that cuts for decades to come. And I think that's something that budget people have to understand. Cuts today, we're gonna be paying for that for decades to come. It's not just a one year thing. That's right. It's in the services that are not being provided. It's in academic instruction that's not gonna be provided. That's in remedial work the students need that won't be happening. All those things are going to make our system further and further and further behind. 10 years down the road, we're gonna need a lot more resources to bring us all up to where we need to be. It's a short-sighted financial strategy that does not make sense in the long run. So the state revenue bills, and we also have to go after the federal funding. So I hope that parents out there and advocates, we can work together to get federal funding into the city system and push for the revenue bills at the state level and pressure the city government not to cut education funding. Thank you, thank you, Shino. Um, I mean, you listed some of the most important parts and I'm with you 100% of the way because that's literally part of my budget speech which was just to say like, you know, we should have taken on the responsibility of cushioning some of the, some of the blow, right? Because otherwise we're gonna feel the deficit for a very, very long time and we're gonna be entering the deepest recession that we've ever seen in our lives um, or in many lifetimes actually. Um, and I just wanted to say that, um, you know, what you were saying was so true that the resources and the disparities are actually getting a lot worse. Um, because for some students, um, kids who are homeless, for example, and we have a lot of homeless kids in our school system, um, I wanted to uh, kind of just put a story out there because um, you know this was actually one that kind of broke my heart when um, I was talking to this little girl. She was trying to get some food. I was like, how's uh, home you know, remote learning going? And she was just like, oh, um, I don't have a computer, um, so I can't join in yet. And I was just like, oh, okay, well, maybe I can get you a computer. And she was just like, because oh, I don't have a mom and dad to wait in line for me. And I was just like, oh, you don't have a mom and dad to wait in line for you. Like, they couldn't wait to, to get a computer. And then um, I asked her, you know, well, well, maybe they can ship one to you. She says, um, you're not allowed to ship things to the shelter. And um, you're not allowed to ship things to the shelter. You're not also, um, uh, you know, she said they will get stolen. And so, you know, there's, there's folks who um, are completely left behind. Um, you know, I gave her my own computer, which I, you know, my own laptop, but I, I shouldn't have, <laughs> um, you know, been, uh, you know, able to, I shouldn't have had to do that. You know, our system should have been covering that. Um, but, you know, it's like, it's a, it's really devastating. And she was only 12, 
you know, and she was all alone. Um, she she had foster parents that, you know, put her place to place to place. And then, um, and then I think that she ran away, but went to, uh, still wanted to go to school. And it, it, it's a whole story. But I wanted to say that, you know, uh, we have uh, folks who are, who are left behind, but not just are they left behind, um, you know, within the school system as it was already, but the disparity is getting a lot worse and where, you know, they're missing months and months of school, even when they don't want to, right? And I think that that's really heartbreaking and um, something that we need to uh, figure out. Um, so I'm gonna actually um, have Zakia speak and then uh, there's a couple of uh, questions that I wanted to really kind of get to, including uh, ones that people have written in prior and folks that have written into the chat. Thank you, Assemblywoman uh, Woman Nude. Um, yeah, we're here again. Um, first, I want to start off by saying um, Ramadan Mubarak to all the uh, Muslim family out there. So, uh, holy time for us um, and sun up to sundown, we're fasting. So, I think that's another thing that educators and others need to take um, heed of and understand and give parents and community members and students some grace in this moment um, to understand that they're fasting. Um, and what could that mean uh, and how could that impact remote learning? Um, I'll say real quick, uh, instead of going to a lot of stuff, we have 112 billionaires in the state, more than in the nation, I think more than in the world, uh, for $525 billion of wealth. That was pre-pandemic, uh, where we know many of them have guarded way more wealth as we speak. Um, we, would, we don't need to be in this situation right now, but we have a governor who chose to put us in this situation right now. So let's be clear on that. I think as we talk about choice, he made a choice to do that and he has done that for the last 10 years. Um, and so while we might wanna elevate this governor and his response to the pandemic, um, that's your choice and that's your option, but his legacy of 10 years and his uh, mismanagement and inequity and, and his educational racism, I might, might say, and his, and, his, and his inequitable funding of our public schools cannot be denied. And we must constantly bring that up, right? Um, so this budget, zero dollar increase, uh, which meant specifically for New York City, more than $500 million in cuts, um, a $0 increase across the state, and uh, while at the same time, uh, we're in the midst of a pandemic, right? Um, so we need leadership, uh, and Governor Cuomo has not been there. I also want to call in and say, I don't know, I, you know, has, has anybody seen or heard from Carl Hasty or Andrea Stewart Cousins, but they've been very silent. We haven't heard them respond. I don't want to hear that it's behind the scenes conversations happening. Your community needs you to be public and vocal in this moment right now to say you do not agree with what's happening and these are the things you're doing to make changes. We also know that the governor has rolling powers now um, because of the state legislature, not because of the assemblywoman new, uh, but because others um, who allows him now, now he has the power to make rolling cuts throughout the year. Um, and we thought that was going to be on April 30th. It's clearly, it seems that he is waiting to see what we get with the stimulus before he decides what he wants to do. That is a problem. I hope that everybody thinks is it. I hope everyone who's listening and those who are not hearing believe that is a problem. Uh, this, this governor cannot be king and ruler. Um, he is he's a governor. Um, and for the fact that we are talking about what Naomi talked about, what Shino talked about, that's what we know. That's not even what we don't know. The impact, the trauma, the harm is there's so many things that we don't know. Um, we were on a call the other day and um, it was shared, how many students will drop out? I had never thought about that. How many kids will we lose? Because they had, didn't have all the things that was just shared. They're in temporary housing, right? And they're experiencing all that. How many will we lose? Um, and I don't think it's, we shouldn't have to lose any, right? And so I think the continuation of what the governor did on the state budget, and let's be clear, he's been doing this for his whole 10 years and yes, the, the, the gap between the wealthiest school districts, the 100 wealthiest and 100 poorest school districts have grown to more than $10,000. Unacceptable. But these are the things that no one knows because we're so um, focused, rightfully so, on this pandemic. Um, this governor ran as the anti, you know, I'm going to be the anti-Trump. I didn't vote for him either three times. He ran as the anti-Trump, was a low bar from the get-go. But he's done so many things. He's a corporate dem who cares about who's funding his schools. He's a corporate dem that doesn't care about the people, right? But he talks really good because he's a politician. I'd rather someone who's gonna 
make sure that if it's a, a budget, we believe a budget is a moral document. If that's the case, clearly the governor does not believe that. But if that's the case, where is the governor's morals lie? Because it is not for the people. When we had 220,000 less hospital beds, when we dismantled and did so much harm as it pertains to bail reform, we didn't, when we didn't do enough around housing, and now we're sitting here talking about education. And I'll end with this and saying, obviously that translates to New York City budget. Um, I don't need to be a fan of Mayor de Blasio's. One thing we know we need to do is invest and divest, right? Or divest and invest. And we need to divest in NYPD because that budget is $6 billion. And instead of increasing it to create more police officers, which we see what they're already doing in our communities, we see what they already have done in black and brown communities. To increase that budget more is a slap in the face. There's 7,000 cops out six and there's still a bunch roaming. Why do we need more? How do we take time to invest and have a shared sacrifice? Like Brad Lander, Council Member Brad Lander said here in New York City, his community sacrificed a $23 million compost project this year. It was important to their community, but they understood that they had to share in the sacrifice. And so we need to do that. We cannot, we cannot withstand a billion dollar cut in New York City. We just cannot, it will not happen. And so what we can do is tax billionaires who have made more money now than they were even just two months ago. Um, and we need to push the governor and the state leadership to say, yes, we can do that. Yes, we need to do that. And yes, we must do that. Um, and we have a town hall, which was shared in the, in the, um, in the uh, chat uh, coming up this Wednesday, May 6th. New York City in Education is AQE and the Coalition for Educational Justice joining an emergency town hall because we need to all we need all hands on deck right now and we're hoping that all of you will join us in this fight. I, we're, we're not out for the count yet. Um, we got to fight hard because our children deserve every inch and ounce of sweat, tear, and, and, and strength we can to fight against this devastating budget. Thank you. The key is always fire. Um, I just wanted to. Uh, kind of get to the questions really, really quick. We had one um, that was in the chat here. Um, I'm gonna direct this one just to Naomi and Shino real quick, um, and then Zakia can um, follow up with the budget implications. So <clears throat> it says, how will the budget affect Title I schools who are already struggling and rely on PTAs to raise money from the disadvantaged school community? So this is what, exactly what Shino was talking about. With the new grading system the DOE has announced for middle school kids, how will this affect the admissions process for high school? And there are no grades other than N or S. Is that for the whole year or just remote learning? And no absences counted and no state tests. So for Title I funding for schools that do receive Title I, um, I think the DOE is trying to actually make sure whatever Title I funding that does not get spent this school year gets rolled over to next year. So that's one little sort of in the weed kind of thing that we're um, monitoring that makes sure that whatever is not spent this year should be rolled over. But the school should be able to be spending that Title I money now. I think there are ways to do that just to ensure that the families who need resources are getting resources through that Title I funding. Um, in terms of grades, the grading policy the DOE came up with last week is for the, the final grades of the year. So for the marking period that the students are in right now, my understanding is schools are using the existing grading system for this current marking period. And for the final grades, schools need to use the guidance that came out from the central office this last week. So for um, K through five, that's meeting standards or needs improvement. Those are the two categories. For middle school, you have meeting standards, needs improvement, and there is another category called in progress. And the details, we need to actually ask those who came up with a policy for what that means in terms of in progress. Um, because it's essentially, it's, it probably means summer school or additional instruction somehow to move you from in progress to meeting standards. I think that's how they're going to do that piece. For high schools, it's um, existing either letter grades or 100 point scale, except no student will be given a failing grade. So those students who can't make the passing grade, they will be given in progress again. And the high school students will have until January 2021 
to make up that lost work to gain that credit. So that's sort of the nutshell that I, the way I understand it, but I definitely urge parents to check in with their schools and also the DOE website to read up on the details of these policies. Uh, PTA fundraising, who knows what's gonna happen? I really have no clue. And we'll uh, make sure the DOE website is on the uh, chat list for everyone. Great. Um, this one's coming from uh, Aaron. I'm having a hard time finding a simple way for my students to access telemedicine, telecounseling. Is there any easy resource that they can access? Um, that I don't know. I mean, DOE has posted a lot of sort of, um, you know, DIY resources for families to look up um, like websites and links. Um, personally, I know my one of my kids' um, school counselor has been reaching out to him weekly. They have like a weekly session. Um, you know, it's only like half an hour, but it's literally just a check-in. He's in, in middle school. So that's the way they've been working that. Um, but, you know, for her, she um, extended the option if you wanted to meet via video or via FaceTime. So that's the way that's working. Now, um, I am hearing through um, other sort of um, counseling entities that they have incorporated telemedicine because they have no other choice um, to meet with their clients. So I'm going to gather that CBOs that already have counseling services are continuing that service as well via telemedicine. I would just encourage you to um, reach out if you do have a list of CBOs in your school district. Like, um, if you are in the school district one, let me know. Happy to give you a list of those CBOs that have that. I'm sure Eulene has them as well. Um, and you can reach out to them and they can then give out those um, they can tell you what services they are offering and how you can partner, give, you know, offer them to the families that need it. And I'll make sure to um, put that into our, uh, I'll make sure to mail that out, but I'll put that into our, one of our newsletters as well. That's very helpful, thank you for that question. And also I think UFT is offering free counseling for students yeah. as well, right? So I guess Erin, you're a teacher, so you may, you should be maybe looking into the UFT services. Um, I forgot to answer one part of the question from the last question from Melissa. Admissions, um, I'm throwing my hands up, who knows? I know that the DOE is thinking about it. I know, I know that central office people and enrollment office people know that they have to come up with something soon, but we don't know what that's gonna be like. Thank you. Um, and uh, so maybe this one can go to uh, Zakia. Uh, if the state is $4 billion short of having a truly equitable education system, what parts of the system will actually not be funded this fiscal year? So what's going to be missing? I mean, we already know, if you, uh, you know, the, what's the first thing that normally gets cut, right? It's like art and music and Rochester, they're losing, they, you know, they had this great program. They hired all these social workers to support students in Rochester from any trauma, and they saw results in, in actually academically of, success and they've already had to cut some, now they're looking to cut more. Um, so we know what's gonna happen. In the moment of a pandemic, where students are gonna be so traumatized, families are gonna be traumatized, the one thing we don't need cut are those kind of services. And we know for a fact, those would be the ones that are being cut because you see what's happening in Rochester already. Like they're, they're fighting tooth and nail to keep the few that they have left. Um, and we don't need to be cutting those types of things uh, at all. And we, we, we shouldn't be uh, if we had a governor who cared more about us than he did his donors. Uh, fight words. Um, how will schools be able to resume in the fall under social distancing rules if vaccines are not uh, expected to be available for another 18 months? I mean, I mean, Sheena could toast to it too. I mean, the rumor, I, I don't know for it to be a fact, but what we're hearing is a lot of different uh, uh, analysis, analogies, analysis of how, what that would look like. So uh, we heard that it would be, it could be part-time. Like, how do you have a thousand kids in a school? How do you have, uh, you know, 30 kids in the class or 36 kids in a classroom, like some classrooms have. And so it could be a hybrid of um, uh, off, off sessions, like some kids would come in a day and some would uh, 
to come in the afternoon. Um, you might have some remote learning happening a certain period of time during the week and another half you might be in the school building. At the end of the day, all these things are just really bad, even if that's the case for parents and, and families, because how who works? <laughs> If you have to go out and work and your child is only going to school potentially part time uh, in a building half a day and then goes in later, like who, how does that how does that work? Um, so I'll stop it there. I mean, that's what we hear, we're hearing. I don't know exactly what it looks like. I don't see us being back in the school, but that's just me, not AQE. I don't see how that what that looks like right now. Um, but she know on there we might have some. Either one of you. I have the same information. I know the DOE has a contract with a vendor to actually start thinking about a variety of scenarios, but I don't really know what they all are. I did hear maybe, you know, two days in the building, three days at school, I'm at home, remote learning, that kind of scenario that we don't really know. I was hearing like reduced class size, six feet apart, which will mean probably no more than 10 to 15 kids max, depending the size of your classroom, depending the structure of your building. And in school district one, we have buildings that are over a hundred years old. So that means like maybe six kids in the classroom. Um, I think sadly, this is really gonna go down to the wire um, of how this is gonna come because much like everything else DOE does, it's always super last minute or the day before. So. I don't doubt this will be much the same. Um, so, so you had talked about this before, about the correlation between funding and class size. Um, and if there is social distancing that makes it so that, I mean, we're already not able to get our class sizes down um, with the funding that we had and now with cuts um, and they're expecting uh, teachers to have even smaller class sizes where social distancing thing to happen. I'm just, I'm just wondering how that's going to work out and if there's any logical actual answer to that because that sounds like the opposite of possible. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not just impossible. It's like literally, I don't think that that's not, that's, it's, uh, that doesn't sound like math to me. That doesn't sound like the math is going to work out. So I don't know what your thoughts are on that. I mean, that's just a follow-up question, I guess. But um, I think, you know, if, if, if we've been fighting for smaller classrooms for so long and we couldn't get it with the funding we have, and then, um, and now with cuts, they expect people to social distance and have smaller classrooms, I'm not sure how that's gonna go. Well, I think the only way the math can make sense is if every student cuts down the number of instructional hours by half, right? I mean, that's the only way to actually create small class sizes. And I don't know if the New York State Education Department is gonna do something like that, I have no idea. But there, it's physically not possible to reduce class sizes with the current funding, let alone reduce funding. And we simply don't have enough space either because as you know, the capital plan is not funded at the full level that it needs to be. So I'm just, you know, guessing, but how else would you have small class sizes? You just scared the crap out of me. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Does that mean that they're gonna like just swap kids out as fast as ca they can, like 20 minutes each or something? Who knows? Who knows what they're thinking? I mean, I think that's part of the problem. Am I, am I on mute? No, I'm not. <laughs> I think that's part of the problem. Like, there's so <laughs> many unknowns um, and that, um, but at, and at the same time, understanding that this is something very new and there's a lot of different moving parts and components that the Department of Education has to figure out how they pull together. But I think the fact that you're having this conversation allows us to elevate those things. So we should all be asking these questions. We should all be thinking about what that looks like. Because at the end of the day, if that happens, what does this look like? I think we've done a lot of impossible things, things that people said could not be done, right? We got nurses in every school, right? We, we, uh, paid sick leave and all these other things national, federally that we couldn't do, but somehow we did it all. Big businesses now, you know, found it hard to give kids computers, et cetera. These are things that could have been done, but it took a pandemic. I think I heard on another part, one of the other panels say something like that. It took a pandemic for us to all be in the same boat to realize that, you know, we, we can do some things, right? While at the same, same time understanding that disaster capitalism is happening at the same time. Right. And so that's why Jeff Bezos, because everybody's ordering and his mindset, it wasn't like, let's make sure the workers are in healthy spaces. That wasn't it. It was like, how do we hire more people to, to manage demand? And now he's like a trillionaire. Right. So how do we pay attention to all these things and acknowledge that Joanne, I think on the last panel said, we cannot go back to normal. The only normal I want to go back to is being able to hug on folks and love on people. 
The other normal we had didn't serve everybody well. Matt, it didn't serve most of us well. And we're seeing that firsthand play out, regardless of Trump or not. Like he's just, he's the, the bottom of the bottom. But we are really seeing a couple of things. One, how people can step up and support each other and what we should be doing from the get-go, checking on our elderly, taking care of our undocumented folks and protecting them, taking care of each other and looking out for each other and feeding people and housing them, right? Basic things that we should all already have been doing. And hopefully that reminds us that, and we don't want to go back to normal. So when people say, let's go back to normal, we don't want to do it. And lastly, I'll just say, I know people, you know, the, the, the Department of Education, I want to be clear, like Chancellor Carranza, you may, you can, you can say you don't like uh, um, the policy, but this man put forth equity for all. When for 12 years we had Bloomberg who didn't care a hoot about any of us, privatized the heck out of our schools, cut them as well, and put tons of NYPD to the tunes of which we spend hundreds of millions of dollars on police and schools. He put forth all these different agendas and put people in it who look like all of us on this call right now. All of us. When there was hardly anybody that looked like any of us on this call right now. And so while everything is not rosy and perfect, let me be clear, this man cares about our kids and he wants them to do right. And if anything, we should understand that we have to do the outside, in, inside, outside strategy because it's us, the parents, community members, and educators who are going to move the system because the system is not going to move if we don't. You're right. You're right. And I just wanted to say something else that um, just kind of close us out on stuff. But, um, you know, what, what you said just like hit home because I, I was, you and I actually had a little Twitter combo about it earlier, but, um, you know, we're in the same storm, but we're not in the same boat. We're not, we're not like everybody's in different boats, man. And there's like some people who are in yachts and some people got a floaty device and sometimes the floaty device got a hole in it, you know, like some people got dinghies, you know, and a little raft or something, but it's just, it's, we're not in the same boat and that storm is going to hit certain people harder than others. And um, some people will be wiped out because of that storm. And I think that, you know, we have to make sure to be very conscientious about um, about how that reflects, especially uh, in our in our education system, where uh, disparity and uh, where um, you know inequality can actually start for a small child. And so, I wanted to um, just say, uh, in closing, for our entire uh, workshop and for our entire town hall, that you know, right now, um, you know, what Zakia just said was so so true. You know. Um, you know, this is a spotlight, you know, it took a pandemic, it took a pandemic to show us where there are so many things that we've done wrong, and so many things that we needed to change. And so many things that, you know, I mean, we shed pur purposefully, we shed 25,000 hospital beds. Do people realize that? Like, it's like a thing, you know, and, and, and so I think, you know, what Joanne was saying about how like, there is no new normal, like what you were saying, Zakia, also, you know, it's, it's true, but also I think that there are things that we are learning to. Um, one of the biggest is how interconnected we actually all are. And, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, we're interconnected and we affect one another. And so when we help others also, like we're helping ourselves, you know, when I'm helping my neighbor, I'm helping myself, making sure that somebody's safe. Like I'm helping everybody else around them stay safe too, you know? And we also know that the folks who are taking the hardest hits and the biggest risks and, 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 and forced to be at the front lines are the people who are also not covered by our system that are not, you know, even thought about in our system. And we also know that we cannot cut our way out of this. We cannot cut our way out of a recession and we cannot cut our way to recovery. And investing in healthcare will heal us. Investing in housing will keep us safe. Investing in our kids and in our education system will grow our economy and help us to recovery. And we need a budget that shows that we value people and that we value that interconnectedness and that we value um, infrastructure and the things that will help to build us, not to cut us and tear us down. And I think that um, these cuts are hurting us in ways that in ways that are just so visible that you can't deny it. The domino effect isn't hidden anymore. 
it's not like you can go about your daily life and just think, you know, oh, nothing's changed. The domino effect is right now. It's every day. And it's for that little girl. It's for the restaurants. It's for every single person who can't pay rent, who couldn't pay rent yesterday. It's for every single person who, you know, is traumatized by what's going on right now. And I just wanted to say thank you so much. We're all fighting for budget justice. We're all fighting to make sure that the folks in our neighborhoods can get the things that they need and so desperately need right now. Um, I can't ask for better partners in my elected officials. Carly and I, I'm looking at you right now. Um, I, I can't ask for better partners. I can't ask for better advocates than all the people who took you know, the time to advocate uh, today. And I, I just wanna say thank you for all of you for taking the time and for taking um, so much care of your community. Um, and I also wanted to add that there was one more question by Erin, um, but I think we're gonna, um, I, I, she wants to touch base. I know that all of you can see the chat on, on her plans and uh, to, to work on some of the education stuff. And so maybe Naomi, Shino, Azakia, maybe you guys can talk to her as well and reach out to her as well. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you so much to all of you. And I don't wanna leave any questions unanswered, but um, we have a couple and I'm, I'll get back to every single person who wrote to me um, and I'll get back to folks uh, with answers, uh, you know, regarding um, different services in our newsletters, et cetera. And again, um, thank you all for joining us. And, you know, hopefully we have uh, another town hall soon, um, but hopefully together. So thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everyone.